will now call this special workshop meeting of the Jacksonville City Council to order. Council, you have a copy of the proposed agenda for tonight's meeting uh, at your place, and I would entertain a motion to adopt the... We have one addition, Mr. Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry. And the addition with this add-on here, this uh, request for council action here. Move for adoption of the agenda as amended. Second. Any discussion? Hearing on all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed. We do have one presentation to make tonight, and I will call Jason Larson, our code enforcement officer, forward to make that presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, staff. Thank you. Uh, when I found out we were having a budget party and I was not invited, uh, I got over it. But uh, I asked Dr. Woodruff if I could come tonight and bring some uh, some seriousness from code enforcement. Um, Although code enforcement plates are full year-round, most of you know we are knee-deep in high grass and weeds throughout the summer. Pun intended. Uh, if you ask me, we cut so much crash, we just start a bartering system between us and Arizona. We send them some grass, they send us some pine needles. I don't, we buy it in bulk, I don't get it. Um, but because we're so busy abating grass and weeds, especially from early spring to late winter, uh, we actually abated some grass and weeds in December last year. That was a record for us. Uh, it's almost impossible to get by uh, on, our, on our own. This is where our local citizens and our deputized junior code enforcement officers come in. Without their help, many of our high grass and weed properties would go abandoned, and before we knew it, Jacksonville would become a tropic. So you can imagine, when I heard from Dr. Woodruff, that one of our code enforcement officers was down and could possibly be down for an entire summer, a small part of me began to panic. No, not in the summer. What are we going to do? But I thought, no worries. You have two incredible code enforcement officers, Frank and Phyllis, an exemplary administrative coordinator, Rhonda Willingham, and our fearless leader, Tracy Jackson, and most of all, our honorary officers. So today, I would like to recognize and introduce our newest honorary code officer. From his keen eye and unparalleled ability to detect high grass and weed from a single glance, running by at speeds up to however fast runners run, I don't know, <laughs> to his ability to hear construction going on in the distance without building permits, it gives me great pleasure today to introduce and recognize our newest honorary junior code enforcement officer, Councilman Bob Warden. <laughs> I do get a badge. Yes, sir. <laughs> Man, no, that makes it all worth it. Show us your badge. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, you got to show that. Oh, and a, and, a, and a whistle, too. You got a whistle, a badge, and a gun? No, I, no. I don't even get it. Oh, you don't get a gun? Thanks. Thanks. Great to have you on What's that pay? <laughs> A lot. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for asking. I was I was too embarrassed to ask. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well done. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. And while Jason's here, I will mention to you. Uh, you may see. You may have seen an email this afternoon, uh, but this morning, with the work of code enforcement, uh, stormwater, and streets, we've abated our tenth vessel, and we now have uh, actually seventeen abated, and ten have been. Uh, have been uh, dismantled and taken to the landfill. So the work that you did several months ago of establishing that new ordinance and giving us direction, uh, CJ and his people and the other departments have really made it successful. So well done, CJ. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Well done. Uh, we're going to go ahead now with the uh, add-on to the agenda here. With This is a resolution seeking okay. local bill delaying the 2021 elections for, for one year. Yeah. Mr. Carter is going to present this to you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. The lawyers get paid for words. Uh, we get paid for words spoken. We get paid for words written. And many times we get paid to interpret words. And I think as we I walk you through what has happened since we last talked about the uh, census and redistricting and how it affects this year's local municipal elections. 
you're going to understand a little bit better about how words play in with the lawyers. The last time we met, I made you aware of a statute that's still out there, still good. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's entitled Special Rules for Redistricting After a Federal Decennial Census. And I want to just pick out two little parts of it tonight because that's in reference to what I'm going to talk about. And the first is the first seven words. It says, as soon as possible after receipt of federal decennial census information. Okay, we're going to come back to those seven or eight words there. And then, as I've told you before, pursuant to the statute, council has the authority to pass a resolution and to delay the election and with a nonpartisan plurality election like the council has, and we have here in Jacksonville, it is delayed until the primary election for county officers in the second year following the census. So therefore, it would be delayed until next year. But we're going to come back and talk about that a little bit more because it gets into when you file for those offices and what kind of window we have as far as for y'all to get the redistricting done, get the wards reapportioned, et cetera. Back in March, I got a blog, or everybody got a blog who's on the School of Government, and it's from a gentleman who's been a professor, a lawyer there for 30 plus years. I've known him a long, long time. A great guy. And he's, his blog was on the census and redistricting and municipal elections. And he caused quite a stir in the municipal attorney's uh, deal because he brought up a, a new concept and idea. The first thing he said was, can a city defer their own elections? And the answer is no. You can't do that unless you do it under that statute, like I said. But again, that's, you're doing it because you're giving authority by the legislature. Then Mr. His name is Bob Joyce. Then Mr. Joyce goes on and he writes these words. <clears throat> when the census is normal, and again, we know it's not been normal this year because uh, we're looking right now, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, the end of September or around the September before we get the, the, the block census data that's necessary to do the redistricting. But he says, when the census is normal and the numbers arrive on the regular schedule, there is, in fact, a state statute that allows cities on their own to, de to delay their elections after a census. That's the statute I'm talking about. If they determine that it would, quote, most likely not be possible, end quote, to draw new districts by the filing period, then the city can, on its own, delay the elections for a year. But that statute assumes that the city has the census numbers and, for whatever reason, cannot get new districts in place. It begins this way, and he's going to require, repeat the same seven words that I or eight words that I have. Quote, as soon as possible after receipt of the federal decennial census information, end quote, the city council has decided whether the delay is required. But in 2021, the census numbers won't be available and won't be coming in time to make such a determination. I don't think this statute applies in 2021. And further, the statute says that if the districts cannot be available in time, then the elections are not delayed a year, but the election shall be held on the regular cycle. Mm -hmm. He then goes on to say, so what do you do? In the end, of course, we look to the General Assembly to do something, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. But he further says this. This is a tough prescription. Cities would be holding elections in November of 2021 that they know for a fact are unconstitutionally unbalanced. They will know that because by the time they will, that is, they get to that election time in November, you'll have the data, and pre presumably, they will have the new census numbers, and therefore they'll know our wards are out of the equality that they should each have as far as voters. They may be sued. But according to Mr. Joyce, I do not see how cities can, without authorization from the General Assembly, do anything else. Well, when I got this blog, the first thing I decided to do was to reach out to our favorite former mayor pro tem, Senator Lazara, and to make him aware of it. Because he, of course, being aware in our discussions even before he became a senator, and I said, Senator Lazara, you know, this is the blog that's being disseminated. I said, you know, this really puts a wrinkle on what everyone had planned as far as how we would uh, take care of the delay this year. He said, well, let me look into it, John. Send me the blog. And he says, um, 
I'll see as far as what kind of interest is in the leadership in doing something statewide and, and so forth. But he did carry it to Senator Berger, and Senator Berger's um, senior policy counsel, and he spells C-O-U-N-S-E-L, I presume he's an attorney, but he's a senior policy counsel, wrote this reply, and this is part of it. With, the res with respect to the interpretation from Bob Joyce from the UNC School of Government, his interpretation is novel. I had to stop right there. Novel? I think I've heard that a few times in the last 18 months. I know what a novel is as far as a book of fiction when you use it as a noun, but what are all these guys talking about novel coronaviruses and novel uh, interpretations? So I went to my favorite dictionary, and this is what that term means as far as if you use it as an adjective. It means of a new and an unusual kind, a different from anything seen or known before, a novel idea. So I can tell already that this lawyer does not agree with this lawyer, okay? That's where we're at so far. But again, Mr. Woodcock keeps going and says, again, Mr. Joyce is taking the position that because five sentences earlier in this statute, there's a sentence conditioned on, quote, as soon as possible after receipt of federal decennial census information, end quote, that means the city has to wait until the census data is received before acting. But that defeats the purpose of the law, which is that if sufficient information is not available to redistrict in ample time to adhere to the existing election schedule, there's a safety valve that can be assessed by cities. So I got that in hand. And I've been working with the league and so forth. And then, then I thought to myself, well, even if that statute is applicable, let's say we take this lawyer's position, not uh, Bob Joyce's position with the School of Government. Where does that put the city council, the Jackson City Council? Well, if you don't get the information, let's say we do the resolution, you delay the election, but if you don't get the information for September 30th, and unless something changes, and right now nobody knows when any election is going to occur in the next year or two. Basically, we check with the Board of Elections. They don't know when the filing fee will be or filing period will be for the county commissioners and so forth. They haven't gotten that information from the state board. That was the reply that we got today. But let's just presume, as I think I've told you before, you get the information in September. The county commissioners in the normal year, they file when? December to have a primary in March. If you get the information in September and you've got to be redistricted, you've got to have the public input, you've got to let the Board of Election know what your districts are, the holidays that are coming, there's no way in the world you can do it in two months or whatever. So it's an uncertainty as you can see where I'm, I'm going here. So over the weekend, I'm looking online at WRAL uh, website. And this is what I find an article on redistricting. And this is the quote from that article. It says more than 60 cities, and I believe it's about 42, but it says more than 60 cities and towns out of almost of 500 municipalities statewide use census data to redraw wards or districts. So most aren't affected by the census delay. Senator Berger said the affected communities have the ability to hold their elections using the current districts, Again, we got the issue here, is it something unconstitutional, is it illegal or whatever, but he said that. Comma, or individual towns or cities can ask the legislature to pass local bills to address their specific elections. As soon as I get that over the weekend, on Monday morning I come into the office, and again, like I said, I've been keeping up with the league on this too. They're having a roundtable tomorrow wanting to talk about a virtual meeting as far as elections go. And one of the com Mints and their thing is, quote, if your elections proceed without required redistricting, there is a risk of such elections being found unconstitutional. So again, I get in touch with Senator Lazaro, and again he tells me that he doesn't know why. And I guess we could all think of different reasons, but there, at this moment in time, and we have to look at things in moments in time, at this moment in time, there's no interest in the legislature of doing something that would cover the whole state, all 42, 60, whatever cities that have to do it. There's just no interest there. He said to me he would, however, be very comfortable 
introducing a local bill to deal with the city of Jacksonville as far as giving us specificity and so forth. There's several reasons to do this. Number one, this is an important decision that council will be faced in the next eight to ten months, the redistricting. It is something that will be with the city for ten years. So it's, very, it's much more important to do it correctly than to do it speedily. So I have prepared a proposed resolution, which I would like to go over with you and, and uh, see if the council would be interested in passing this. It is a resolution seeking the enactment of legislation authorizing a delay in the 2021 municipal elections. And I'm going to read it because y'all have just gotten it at your places this evening. It hadn't been provided to you earlier. And again, this can be molded or modified. Whereas the city of Jacksonville has a ward district form of elections, and these wards have to be redistricted every federal decennial census, here and after referred to as census, so as to ensure that there's an equal number of voters in each ward pursuant to federal and state law. And whereas the Federal Census Bureau has indicated that the necessary block census data to accomplish ward redistricting will not be released until on or about September 30th, 2021, and whereas North Carolina General Statute 168-23.1 allows for municipal elections to be delayed during years after a census, but said statute says that in order to utilize the statute, that census information must be received, which will not be the case prior to the normal July 2021 filing period. Comma. And whereas the time between the expected date of receiving the block census data and the filing period under North Carolina General Statute 168-23.1 is only approximately two months. And whereas the legal interpretation of NCGS 168-23.1 and the short period of time in which to redistrict and have public input places a cloud on anything the city might do outside of a special local bill given certainty to the election timing and ensuring that adequate time is granted to properly redistrict with the new census data and to receive public input, especially as to maintaining the two minority majority wards. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the City of J Council that Senator Michael Lazar is respectfully requested to file a local bill to delay the City of Jacksonville 2021 municipal elections for one year until 2022 so that the City might receive and utilize the census data and redistrict their awards in accordance with federal and state law. And further be it resolved that the filing period will be delayed from July 2021 until July 2022 in accordance with, and this is a different statute, 163-294.2 C1, and that the election will take place during the 2022 general elections. And on the back, or page two, is another paragraph. Further be it resolved that the Jacksonville City Attorney is to work with the Onslow County Board of Elections and our legislative delegation to ensure that the intent of this resolution is carried out. So what does this mean specifically for you and the wards and people that you represent? The folks who are coming up for election this year would be Ward Representative Mr. Jackson, Ward Representative Mr. Bittner, and the two at-large members, Mr. Warden and Mr. Thomas. This would mean that those wards uh, persons and others who might want to file would be filing in July of 2022 and would have a three-year term, whoever's elected there. Again, it would their term would be from 2022 to 2025 instead of the normal four years because you're taking one year there. For, and I'm going to come back to Mr. Sosa because he's a little bit different. Uh, again, for the mayor, for Dr. Washington, Ward 4, and Mr. Uh, and let me talk to Mr. Sosa first before I get to those. Mr. Sosa is serving the unexpired term of Mr. Lazaro. When Mr. Lazaro went to the Senate, he had two years on that term. So Mr. Sosa would run in 2022 along with the other four that I've already mentioned, but he would be running for just a one-year term. He would then have to turn around and run in 2023 for a full four-year term because he's, that's just the way the law is written. Again, Mayor Dr. Washington and Mr. Sosa in 2023 would run for a four-year term if they desired to do, and that, of course, would carry them to 2027. Again, the perfect answer or the answer is for the legislature to do something on a statewide basis. And all I can tell you is today, 
and again, there were others in the room who heard the same thing. There's just not an interest in the leadership to do anything at this moment in time. But for, I'm not, I'm interested in everybody else, but my interest is the city of Jacksonville and this council and how you can move forward knowing what you can do and cannot do as far as when the election will occur. And again, I believe that the local bill, Mr. Lazar, Senator Lazar, is offering to introduce in accordance here would give certainty to uh, an uncertain situation, as I've already went over to you, one lawyer over here, another lawyer over here, but would give certainty to your election and what your uh, obligations and options would be, again, having an election next year, putting it off one year. Plus, it gives you that year to get that data, to take two, three, four months, whatever it takes, you've got adequate time to have the public hearings, to have the input. We're going to be taking little blocks and we're going to say, how do we keep these minority majority districts, uh, these wards, with these little blocks? So we've got to do that. We've then got to bring in, through some kind of public input, uh, especially the minority uh, citizens, to come in to say, we, we with expert folks, uh, have actually gone through this process, and this is the best, because you know last time we had a hard time with, with the redistricting. This is the best that we can do as far as re retaining the minority-majority wards, because as we've said, we've become a very integrated city. But we need time to do that, to get that public comment and input, so that when you as a council, you're the ones who are ultimately going to say, we bless these wards or we don't bless these wards. When you do that, then after all said and done, that data is then given to the Board of Elections. They then have to put that into their computers and other software or whatever and to actually fix it so they can have elections for Ward 1, 2, 3, and 4. There's a lot of moving parts here that's going to be required to make this thing happen. And again, to try to do it, even if you take the, the speaker's uh, lawyer's position, again, not knowing where, when the county commissioners are going to have to file, that easily could be put off. But again, this gives some certainty and gives folks an ability to plan, gives folks an ability to tell their uh, citizens whom they represent, going forward, this is what we're going to do, and we're doing it to protect you and your interests to make sure that we hear from them <clears throat> as we go through this redistricting process. Be glad mm -hmm. to try to answer any questions and hope that I've halfway yeah. explained it. Yes, sir, Dr. Washington. Um, once we determine the redistricting and the information is then given to the Board of Elections, does that information also have to funnel through the Department of Justice for approval? Yes, the uh, preclearance requirement has been done away with, mm -hmm. uh, as far as you know, we used to. And that, that added another mm -hmm. layer, if you will, and so forth. But the preclearance is no longer the Supreme Court did away, I think it was 2013 in the case. So it doesn't have to be pre-cleared. Okay. And then I have one more question, I do believe. Um, ten years ago, when the city of Jacksonville was going through this process, I do believe Senator Harry Brown was our senator at that time. Okay. Um, did the council have some type of resolution to go through him um, to support a delay in the city election, or was there something different that happened ten years what happened 10 years ago with that process that now we're having to ask Senator Lazara for a resolution? What happened 10 years ago was that the data, the census block data, was received in a timely fashion. Okay, that's it. And we were able to have the, there was a committee established, Glenn Hargett, Bob Warlick, Robert Sandy, several others were, were on that committee and were able to uh, actually do it and said that there was not a delay. Now, if you want to go back 20 years, which I can go back 20 years with you, uh, that's when there was, this statute was used, and there was a delay. And as I indicated to you a couple of, well, several meetings ago, when that election occurred, it occurred in 2002, and it actually was put off until September of 2002 so that you had a mayor, and again, we didn't have the four every four years, but you did have a ward system. Everybody just had a two-year term. But the mayor and all six council members were sworn in on October 1, or thereabouts, 2002, and served only one year. So they, in July of 2003, they had to file again to run in November. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Mm -hmm. And last question. Yes, Do you remember what year the war systems were established? It was 98 or 99, six in my mind. I can get that exact date for you, but uh, it was certainly in effect uh, for those two redistricting uh, and censuses. <clears throat> yes, sir.
Yes, sir, Doc, Mr. Bitt. I see where we're requesting Senator Azara for a local bill. What about the House side of it? That's why I put that uh, in the last whereas or the resolve that I could work with the legislative delegation. We sought out Senator Lazar for several reasons I think are pretty evident. He's a former member of this council. He's very familiar with this issue. And in fact, what I hear from the league is they look to him for municipal uh, decisions and how cities and the legislature may work. We, we, we look to him because of that expertise, but we certainly will, once the bill is, if it is, happens, is formulated, we will clearly get in touch with Representative Cleveland and Representative Shepard to engage them in the conversation, okay. too. And we'll explain it to him just like I'm telling you. That's why we reached out to Senator Lazar, because he had served with us and knew the situation we were trying to address. And it just needs to really be introduced in one house, and he has what they call a blank bill, which is nothing's put in it. But if you go past deadlines, you have to have bills like that so that you can go ahead and fill it out for different things. But he, he tells us he's prepared. He just wanted to get word from the council, whatever y'all wanted him to do. He's certainly a good friend of the city of Jackson. We all know that. Yeah. Right, because you wanted to propose this for us to actually vote on it tonight? Yes, sir, so I can get it to Senator Lazar to move forward. I'm not comfortable actually doing this tonight. I'm not saying that this is something that we won't do and that I wouldn't stand by in the future. But I wouldn't do this right now. Mr. Give me a y'all. week. Uh, the reason we added this on and asked for tonight, when you're dealing with the legislature, sometimes they're slow and other times they're ready to do business. And they move things up and uh, very quickly. Uh, I think time is of the essence, but if you want to delay this and think about it until next Tuesday night. That's certainly uh, we're at the pleasure of the council. I'd, I'll be right uh, up in front and honest with everybody. I try to do that every day. I would like this to be a unanimous vote or not a vote at all because I want Senator Lazar to know that his council stands together on this issue, the two minority ward representatives as well as all the others. So if you're more comfortable, I would certainly ask the mayor and council to put it off on t for a week and bring it back and hopefully uh, you'll be comfortable then and we could have a unanimous vote. I would like to put it off to next week. May I make a comment? Yes, sir. Uh, the process of getting the state number in this week was a major step. But all that was was a gross number. The state is not going to be able to use the gross number to figure out how the 14 House of Representatives seats now stand. Normally, any time that I try to be clairvoyant, I turn out to be wrong. There's only one time in my life when that was right, and that was when I married Gwen. Okay? I believe that what's going to happen at the state level is this. They're winners and they're losers. What do I mean by that? North Carolina picked up a seat. Well, guess what? The House of Representatives didn't just go from 435 to 436. State of 435, based upon the Constitution. Guess what? The seat that we picked up as a state came from somebody. Texas picked up seats. Florida picked up seats. Probably somebody else picked up seats. But for every seat that was picked up, somebody lost. You know what that means to me? Lawsuits. The only way that we are going to have certainty in our elections for our city, in my opinion and John's opinion, is with a local bill. I don't have any objection to you postponing it. You can keep postponing it. Postpone it another month, two months, three months, four months. The answer you're going to hear from us is that unless the state legislature steps in and takes an action, John and I are going to continue to advise you to take a local bill. Why? Because of certainty. The other important thing that I'm going to stress is this. Until the block data comes in, we just have nothing to do except, as CJ said, watch the grass grow and issue citations and get a budget adopted. But guess what? Until the block data comes in, there's absolutely nothing you or we can do to move the election process forward. And the last thing I'm going to remind you of is this. Those of us who were around in 2010, 
we remember how difficult it was to come up with the two minority wards. This is an integrated city. And since 2010, it has become more integrated. So again, certainly honor Council Member Jackson's request. I will implore you, you need to make this decision. Don't make it tonight, honor his request. But at the end of the day, this is the decision you need to make. And again, why? Number one, it guarantees a date and a schedule that you are in control of, not the state legislature, not somebody else. Number two, it guarantees that we as a staff will have adequate time to work with you, a citizens committee, and all citizens of Jacksonville to get the wards redistricted. They will have to be redrawn. We've talked, talked to you about that. And the third thing is this. Time is, under this bill, your friend. Without this bill, time is your enemy. Thank you. Very well said. Yeah. Attorney Carter, yes. I would like to put this off a week. Yes, sir. I, I'm not saying I'm against or for it, but I would like to. Yes, sir. I understand. Thank you. We, uh, Council, can we agree to put it off a week contingent on uh, there actually being a vote taken at the next meeting? Is that agreeable? Okay. Does that give you time? Yes. Okay. Well so we'll, we'll, just, we'll just do that then. Appreciate that. get up with uh, Senator Lazar and also make sure that we're within the time frame still. I, I will send him an email tomorrow to him, Council, uh, and, and ask that question. I'll copy all on it, uh, basically saying, you know, but do, if not, I mean, if he says no, I need it by. But I think, you know, he's got these blank bills, or at least a blank bill, that he'll be okay with. How it. long are they in session until? They usually are in session until uh, end of July, end of June. So we, okay. it's a couple of months. But the, with a local bill, there's got to be three readings in each house. You, again, it doesn't just pass one. I mean, there, there's some time issues here, but uh, I'm sure... A week's not going to kill the possibility of, of doing this, right? I do not believe so, sir, but I'll confirm that with Mr. Lazar. Senator Lazar. If we haven't already, I'd suggest we make contact with Shepard and Cleveland. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just one one more question. I apologize. Do we know of any of the municipalities that have started this process? In terms of they have passed some type of resolution for their municipalities at the current time. I'm not aware of anybody okay. who sought a local bill. If it's any, if it's any, you know, with the mayor's association, it sounds like to me mm -hmm. they're all over the board on that one too. Mm -hmm. uh, Ron, correct me if I'm wrong, but. It seems like they were waiting on they were waiting on the legislature, and uh, I guess that's still the deal. But, but as Mr. Carter says, the legislature is just not going to act totally. So I, I agree, with <clears throat> and it was becoming more obvious, as was confirmed <laughs> by Senator Berger's comments I think, last week, that the Senate was not inclined to do a statewide bill. You know, some of the discussions that, that the Metro mayors have had is because there's 42 cities or less that are impacted, that they should allow the rest of the municipal elections to go forward as scheduled. And that's why the state wouldn't just do a bill across the board, which then puts us back to individual local bills where they're needed. All right, so we're going to talk about the budget. Mayor, members of council, I know last week, uh, with the absence of one of your council members, you were able to move right through. Uh, I was hoping that Mr. Sosa was joining us instead of enjoying a vacation. <laughs> on the other hand, knowing that he has good judgment, I'm certain that he was sitting on the beach someplace and uh, left this task in good hands. So welcome back, sir. Tonight we're going to try to go through the remainder of the department budgets and we're also going to get into department issues 
and really come to a focus at the end on what are your real loose ends and the serious challenges. The first one we'd like to begin with is metering, and that's on page 77, 78, and 79. As we begin that, though, we're opening up the discussion about water and sewer. You can see the revenue sources for water and sewer. Charges for services, that's the fees. But it's very interesting, other revenue. Now, other revenue comes from other sources. I guess that's why they call it other revenue. And that's probably the most brilliant statement I will make all night. I want to point out, though, one of the major things that you and your staff have done over the years regarding other revenue. We rent space on the water tanks. And who do we rent them to? The telecommunication industry. Over the last 11 years, the amount of money that we get from renting the water tanks has gone from somewhere around $150,000 to well over a half a million dollars. And why is that? Well, number one, we realized how valuable those towers were. And number two, we know that these people make money. You know, they don't, they don't give you cell service just because they want everybody to have a cell phone. Uh, the last time I checked, Mr. Thomas, I think you probably have a monthly bill for your cell service. Uh, Mr. Jackson, do you have a monthly bill for your cell service? Absolutely. So it's the city's philosophy that we should share in that. And so we have a contract that Wally's uh, staff administers, and it results in none of our leases extending more than seven years. Uh, Eleven years ago, the contracts were 25-year contracts. That's not good business, especially when they're at a set fee. So every seven years, all of these contracts come up for renewal, just like any good business practice. And I can tell you, uh, we are making a reasonable return for your ratepayers. And I use the term ratepayers. All of the money from these towers goes back into the water and sewer fund. None of it goes to any of the general fund, police, fire, stormwater. It all goes straight into water and sewer. And you can imagine, if you're getting roughly a half a million dollars in fees, you are helping the ratepayer. Borrowing, uh, Gail and I talked today about transfers, borrowing, and uh, the appropriated fund balance. Those are the overall revenues of your water and sewer. When you get into the fund balance, remember each of the enterprise funds has their own fund balance. You will notice that the fund balance for water and sewer is substantial. It's substantial for several reasons. Number one, this is where we do our savings account so that we can do large capital projects, hopefully paying for them in advance. Also, your ratios for bond debt are extremely tied to the amount of unrestricted fund balance. If you spent the unrestricted fund balance down, you would run the risk of having higher interest rates and your bonds, whenever they are issued, being uh, less quality bonds. We do anticipate in the coming year with the project that I commonly referred to as the Northwest Passage, the Parkwood Sewer Project, some of this will be drawn down and then it will be replaced with, of course, a bond. Metering is really where we get all of our revenues. I found it interesting that there are over 19,000 customers who are on our cycle. 19,000 accounts. You know that we produce about five, five and a half million gallons of water every day, and it goes out through hundreds of miles, through 100, uh, through 19,000 meters, and eventually they get back. Years ago, the city actually went out and read the meters by driving up to my front yard, getting out, opening up the box, flipping a little 
cover and reading the numbers. Well, Jerry Bittner brought us the idea that technology is actually a good thing. So we no longer have to do that. We now have the ability to literally drive by a meter, and as we drive by, it sends us an electronic message. And it sends us that message by something that's called ERTs. ERTs. Now, I told Gail I was going to ask her this, so I'm going to go ahead and ask her, what does ERT stand for, Gail? I studied this because you told me. <laughs> it's encoder, receiver, transmitters. Encoder, receiver, transmitter. What that, I guess, it means that it transmits. Anderson. Sounds like it. Anderson. But guess what? Those things have been around a long time. And like anything that's been around a long time, they begin to wear out. In last year's budget, you may recall, you budgeted $108,000 to begin to replace these ERTs. Why do you want to replace them? Well, if they're not working, then that customer doesn't get a bill other than the minimum bill. So every year for the next many years, with 19,000 meters out there, we're replacing about 1,000 a year. Over the next several years, we're going to try to step that up because I don't think that these ERTs are going to last 19 more years. But in this year's budget, again, our goal is to fund enough money so that we can replace about 1,000 of those ERTs. And we replace them primarily when we see they're beginning to fail. So that's the real comment about the metering budget. It's the backbone of your billing system. Gail, any other comments on that? Okay. Any questions on the metering? How do we know they're beginning to fail? Well, that's actually a very good question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I would assume, though, that it is when the bills begin to, and we, we analyze the bills on a regular basis. As you know, we analyze bills from a high usage standpoint. Yeah. So I'm assuming that what the staff does is to analyze it from a low usage. For example, at my house, if we normally get a bill, let's say, of $80, and suddenly it drops to 60 whatever the minimum is, uh, that raises flags. Uh, Gail can probably give you a better answer. That's my assumption. Sabrina's the expert. I'll let her answer. The main way that we know that it fails is that it doesn't pick up a read at all when we go to read the get the monthly Sorry. reads. It doesn't pick up a reading at all in the meter reading software, so that's when we know that it's bad. Or if the usage drops very low, we send metering back out to check. How often does that happen, Sabrina? Well, as they're starting to age, it does happen more, and that's what we're changing out. Um, I believe that it's, I think it's 15 years on the battery. I, know, I noticed that you were uh, the handheld that I guess receives the uh, the signal. You're saying that's no longer going to be supported. Is is there a is there an issue with compatibility between the ERTs and a handheld? I mean, obviously they've got to be compatible. Is the ERT that we use compatible with more than one handheld? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming so. Yes, it uh, is. Okay. Yeah. My question is, because we actually have to ride by these meters to pick up that information, correct? Correct. Is there a system, or have you all researched a system that you, act, you know, I don't know if one exists, where you actually can get that from a remote area instead of going out to actually go by the meters themselves? and based on gas, cost of gas, and, you know, the amount of technology, you know. Three or four, probably probably six years ago now, we had a company give us a proposal to fly over the city in a grid pattern and pick up all this so we didn't have to have anybody go out there. Their actual proposal would have cost us more money than our meter readers. What we do know is that Jones Angelo is now going to a low-frequency system on reading electricity and what they will be doing is putting up and i'm just going to make up a grid pattern they're going to be putting up a receiver and all of these erts all of these transmitters will go to one receiver and that receiver will then transmit the data to a central location 
That's not new technology, but it is new technology for us. We have talked to Jones Onslow in the past about them actually reading our meters for us. Uh, they've been hesitant to do that because they feel that they need to first of all get experience with moving from their own readers to technology. Uh, but Mr. Jackson, that is something that we will continue to monitor. Other questions on metering? Let's jump to page 151. This is water and sewer non-departmental. The main thing I would like to point out in this budget is the charges that we pay to Onwasa. As you know, we have two subdivisions in the city, uh, country club area, and then the um, area of Sunset, Sunset Acres, thank you. Uh, and we pay on Wassa $117,100 this year. We also have our share of the Piney Green system that we pay overall this year. We will pay on Wassa $380,591. That is in this budget. We also know that on Wassa is proposing an 8% rate increase. They have not yet voted on that. Uh, but if that occurs, then we will see an additional $10,568. But overall, we have a great partnership with Onwasa. We have uh, just recently signed a bulk agreement where we will be uh, purchasing bulk water from them in a subdivision out the other side of the bypass. But just so you'll know, this is where the Onwasa payments are budgeted. Gail, comments? Any questions on that? Uh, page 155, line maintenance. I know you know many of these numbers, but because the public is listening, I think it's important. The city of Jacksonville water and sewer system delivers water with over 300 miles of distribution lines, and we have over 300 miles of sanitary lines. Now, the sanitary lines are the ones where we are spending an awful lot of money these days in capital projects. Uh, they are in, in many areas. I know in Mr. Jackson's area, there is a road that we are gonna have to be digging up to replace the sewer lines. I know in Northwoods, there are many areas where we have to dig up for sewer lines. But this, the utility maintenance area, this is where your 30 employees who cover all of the issues other than reading meters or replacing a meter. Anything that has to do with our lines for collection or distribution fall on these 30 people. And I will tell you, uh, I think they do an outstanding job. Every year, they ask for an additional employee. I will also say to you that in this budget, you'll notice on page 157, they're asking for an additional employee. Later this evening, you will hear me say that I cannot recommend that employee. And let me explain to you why now. We have to always make sure that we have our bond ratios in balance. We are required to have a certain coverage is the bond term. Until we know how much the Northwest Passage is going to cost us, we have to make absolutely certain that we have not overextended those ratios. So while I will tell you I think they need that employee, I cannot recommend that employee at this time because of our very close numbers relative to uh, the finances. Later this evening, you're going to be talking about rate structure, which will be coming up in just a minute. All of that plays into these types of decisions. Gail, you want to have any other comments on this? Yes, sir. Okay. Wally, would you mind coming to the podium? I apologize. This is actually your department, and 
you may have some things you want to add to. The next, to walk up to the, podium. <laughs> <laughs> the next area is your water supply division. The city currently draws about 1.5 billion gallons of water for treatment every year. And most of the city council that's sitting up there will remember the day that we had the, uh, the turning of the valves to open up the water plant. Well, the good news is that was a 20-year loan. And as of June the 30th, 2020, we will only have 11 years left. Pretty amazing. Why is that important to the rate model and why is that important to the rate payers? You will recall those of you who lived in Jacksonville before the water plant was built, we drew our water out of the Black Creek Aquifer with almost no treatment and your utility bills, I didn't say our because I was not here at that time, your utility bills were extremely low. We built a, what was it, a 40 or $50 million plant. That plant is now coming up on being half paid. So there is a light at the end of the tunnel 10 years down the road, or 11 years down the road, that you will no longer have that debt. Now, you probably would have some other debt, but at least that debt is now roughly half paid. Any questions or staff, any other comments on the water supply? If you turn to the next page, wastewater treatment, there's also, I think, good news there. And that is the 20-year debt only has nine years left on that loan. So looking down the road, you know, about the time that I turned 39 for the 49th time, we will be out of debt on the LTS and on the water plant. Uh, Mr. Sosa, Mr. Jackson, other members of council may, you know, y'all are all young enough. Dr. Washington, you're certainly young enough. Mayor, you're young enough. All of y'all are young enough. You can look forward to that day as elected officials when both of those major capital projects are paid for. Last year, we asked for an experiment out at the LTS, and that had to do with the spray heads. You remember we have 21,000 sprinklers out there, and one of the problems we have is they put out water. Well, that's what a sprinkler is supposed to do. But in putting out the water, it encourages weed growth. And what we know is that as you're out there mowing, it's very difficult to get a mower right up against those spray heads. And little vines grow around those pipes and get into the head and keep it from working. So we came up with what we thought was an ingenious idea. And that was to buy a rubber mat that you would slip over the sprinkler head and the stem, and it would keep the weeds from growing. Well, it has, except for one problem. Our mowers keep hitting the pad, and when it does, it rips the pad, and nine times out of 10, it breaks the pipe off. So in this year's budget, uh, we are looking for a new solution. So if any of y'all are, are master gardeners, have any idea of how we can do a better job of controlling weeds, uh, we will do that. But I wanted to report to you that the experiment you authorized out there last year, uh, we've decided that that really wasn't what we want to do for the future. Comments? No, I agree. That, unfortunately, and what Dr. Woodruff is talking about, are the rubber mats like you put around trees, you can buy them at Lowe's. You know, you plant a tree and it's got a hole in the middle and it expands as the tree grows. But unfortunately, you know, we're not mowing with a lawnmower, we're mowing with an enclosed cab rotary mower, you know, rotary, rotary implement. So as soon as we go by one, it just sucks it in and shreds it. And then it can cause damage to the, what we call the whips, you know, the elevated spray heads. So with, with trepidation, I'm 
I'm going to say Roundup. <laughs> we, we actually do herbiciding out there. Um, what we try to be real careful about is how much we apply mm -hmm. because we do hit permit levels. Um, we do quite a bit as part of our forestry management. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing that we're, we're careful about is in our laterals, uh, which is where our spray heads are located, is vegetation is our friend because it, you know, ve vegetation does take up water, it prevents runoff, it prevents standing water. So we don't want to kill everything off. It's just literally if you picture a, a standing sprinkler with weeds growing up right around the sprinkler, you know, it, it keeps the sprinkler from turning in most cases 360 degrees um, or it, it blocks that sprinkler. So we've, we've, we do do some herbiciding. It's just a lot to do. And we, we try to be very careful about over herbiciding. We've actually talked about goats also. The, the challenge there is they eat everything. They eat the sprinklers. <laughs> so, and, and, um, there is a lot of wildlife. We have a bear that we see quite frequently, coyotes that we trap. Um, so that might be a little hard on the goats. But it is something that we considered. I have a question. Um, I noticed on utilities maintenance, the debt service for the Northwest Passage is being put in there. Why would it not be in the wastewater department? I mean, why? Uh, we made a decision, I think, several, several years ago that anything that was at the land app would be wastewater just on that property. Anything that is within the water plant would be water supply and everything else would be utilities maintenance. It, it was just a... All of the Electricity, maintenance cost, uh, the the lift stations themselves all are in utilities maintenance. So I think the thought was, since it's a lift station, they'll be maintaining it. That's probably where the debt service should be. On the overhead allegation, allocation, not allegation, overhead allocation, Part of every fund is charged back to management, mayor and council, ITS, finance, not ITS, but to finance, to any department that supports it. So you will see the overhead there. And the transfers are simply money that we transfer in and out of the reserve for capital projects. Okay. At this time, you have the privilege of no longer listening to me, and you will hear the probably one of the most important topics of the night, and that is the rate model. So, Wally, do you want to do that from standing or seated? I'm actually going to let Sabrina do that. Sabrina is the brains behind the rate model, so I, I'm here for support. Thank you. <laughs> So just as a review, our rate model was developed for us by a consultant several years ago, and it is used by us as a staff to key in a lot of data and just determine if our rates are sufficient enough to meet some fund balance targets and some debt service um, coverage ratios. So as we're keying in data into the rate model, we do make some assumptions that go into, the, into that as well. For our FY21 expenditures, we uh, have a budget of $16 million, uh, 7357 and then we key in our FY22 proposed budget expenditures as well. We have an expense escalation throughout the model. It carries through for all 10 years, and we uh, ex escalate those expenses up 1.5% to 4% per year based on different categories. We have a modest increase in meters projected at about 100 per year because that's just an average of what we've been seeing. And then we project our water usage growth at 0%. And the reason that we do the, even though we have the increase in meters, the volume is at zero because it's a per meter and we still, people are conserving water and they're using energy efficient um, appliances. So we're not seeing usage really increase for anyone. And then we key in the CIP. We use the FY22 proposed CIP. 
and we have all the projects in the rate model through 2031. And we also included the 9.3 million in funding from the American Rescue Plan and assume that that funding will be used at the, for the Parkwood Regional Project. Okay, this is just a graph that shows um, our water meters with our volume and revenue. You can see that we do have that modest increase in meters and our volume really doesn't fluctuate a whole lot. Our revenue was up a little bit, um, which is mostly a result of the 2.25% increase that we had last year. And then the same for sewer. We gradually increase the number of meters that we have and volume stays pretty flat and the revenue increases, again, a result of that uh, rate increase, the 2.25%. So tonight we'll look at a few different scenarios we ran. Um, we're showing three tonight. Uh, the first scenario will be just in time rate increases. So that would be what we would need if we didn't do the 2.25%, only did increases as we needed them to meet the debt coverage ratios. And then scenario number two would be if we had no rate increase at all for this year and next year, but then 2.25% after that. And then scenario three is an increase of 2.25% annually from now through FY28 with no increases in 29 through 31. So this, um, just to go over the rate model and what you're looking at, the override the very top line that's where we key in uh, whatever rate increase we're doing if we are doing 2.25 percent so when we put when we take it all out like this this is how we get the just in time because we're not telling it a, a certain percentage to increase and then the it has the combined rate plan which our water and sewer we increase the same both are 2.25%, so you can just look at the combined rate uh, plan to see what the increases would be. And then the DSC, all of those rows are um, basically, that's what we're looking at to make sure that we're meeting our debt service coverage. Uh, each, there's different, there's minimum set and then there's targets set. So we typically like to see the blue if we see yellow, like on this one, it, it indicates that we are below what our target is. And then if it turns red, that means that we're below the minimum coverage ratios. And those coverage ratios are uh, required by our covenants and our bond documents. And then at the bottom, it will show you the average water and sewer bill for 6,000 gallons and then the minimum bill as well. So on this particular scenario, we have the just-in-time increases, and you can see that uh, we don't have any increase at all right now. And then in 23, we'll have to have 3.52%, uh, and then 3.12%, and then in 25, actually 8.4%, and then 26.48, um, 0.69, and then zero in 28, and then back up to 1.78 in 29 with zero for the next two years. And you can see on the senior debt service coverage that we do drop a little bit below um, where our target is with that scenario. And then the other thing that we are looking at um, with the rate model is we want to make sure that our fund balance is not depleted. So the black line is our target, which we have at 10 million and um, the both current and last plan on this one are the just-in-time rate increases. They're exactly the same. Going to the next scenarios, the last plan, the green one, will always be the just-in-time so that you can compare the two. So this is scenario two where we would have no increase in FY22 and 23, but then we would continue with the 2.25% through um, 2031. And you can see that we, on our uh, senior debt service uh, coverage, we do drop below what is required um, in 2024. And there's 
several years that were below what our target would be in this scenario. And you can also see um, the average water and sewer bill compared to the just in time, we would, by 2031, we would be at 102.95, with the just in time would have us at 102.67. And then you can see the minimum bill is there as well. Okay. And then for our fund balance, um, we, d we do start depleting the fund balance. Um, and by the time we get to uh, 31, we're below what our target would be. And this is scenario number three. The last scenario, this would be what um, the 2.25 increases through FY28. And then we put no increases in 29 through 31 because as of right now, uh, the rate model was indicating that it wouldn't be necessary. And you can see that even that we are in some years below our target, we don't have any of the, um, we're not below the minimum required coverage ratio at all. And again, we are comparing here to our just-in-time increases on the average water sewer bill and the minimum bill. And so when we get to the end with this one, with the 2.25, we're at $100.68 as opposed to the 102.67. And then we have our fund balance target here. We are um, above the 10 million on this plan. And this is the comparison just with the three scenarios so that you could see in one place where the minimum bill ends up and then where the um, with the, where the increases are. So the first one is the just in time. Number two is the no increases and in the front end. And then number three is no increases at the, at the back. So you can see the different rates through the years, what they would be. And then our recommendation would be that we continue with the 2.25% increases that we have been doing scenario number three and then we do update the rate model every year but reevaluate it later um, for increases that would be needed beyond fiscal year 28. Could you go back one slide? Yes. Sabrina now what happened that, did did you run it without the 9.3 would it from the A, I mean, would, would, we've had a bunch more orange in there without the 9.3 because I was looking for a benefit to the ratepayers of the 9.3, and I'm not quite seeing it. I mean, are we just going to not obviously not borrow that amount of money for the project? Is that how? Right, we did reduce the amount of money that we're borrowing for that project. And so that was reflected but, in the in the yes. increase in the in the utilities thing. So. Had we not gotten that, we'd have been pushing for a higher rate increase during this term, or? Yes, the, without that, the just-in-time rate increases are higher. Yeah, one of the things to remember is we have had the all of the easements and everything secured for that project for four years, five years. And what's happened is, uh, and this is not a critical statement, it's just a factual statement, if we had built the line five or six years ago, it would have been less expensive. Uh, fortunately, the $9 million that we're going to get from the uh, federal government uh, is going to offset most of the inflation that we've seen over the last six years. Otherwise, to build that project you know, would basically be anywhere from six to nine million dollars more. I mean, you've seen it because you're on the Water and Sewer Advisory Committee. You've seen these numbers go up every year. Okay. So if the nine million dollars was not there, uh, you might actually be looking this evening at a proposal to have rates, rate increases larger than what we're proposing. Um, if you look at the minimum bill across all of them, uh, you know, you will notice, and that's, you know, this is the combined rate. So for 
uh, for 21, 22, and just keep going out, just read across and read down. Um, it doesn't really matter which one you pick. They, the rates need to change at some point. So what our philosophy has always been is to have as much stability in the financial structure as you can, and that's why we would continue to recommend to you Scenario 3. I would also remind you that even though ANWASA has not uh, taken a formal vote, uh, we are being told that they are going to be recommending an 8% increase. Now, whether that's what they wind up with or not, I do not know. But we as a staff would continue to recommend that you keep the 2.25. Not a decision you have to make tonight, but we are going to be asking you to make that decision at your next meeting. We're showing the 21 with no, no ink. Did we not do a, a 2.25 for 21? No, you did a, a 2.25 for 21. Right, that rate is already reflected in the rate model, so that's why we put the zero there. Right, thank you. Can I add to the comment on the $9.3 million? Um, we ran the model before when we, when we brought the uh, proposed water and sewer capital improvement program to the Water and Sewer Advisory Committee, and we did run it without the... Um, without the $9.3 million in there. And the big change because of the decision to apply it to the um, Western Regional Parkwood project is really those out years because the bond payment is less. Um, and in addition, if you remember, when we talked to you several months ago about moving forward with the uh, Parkwood project, we do have some um, alternates that we're including in the project that may can help reduce the cost of that project in the future or as we build it, but that's something that we we'll bring back to you for a final decision. So uh, in a, a simple one that we talked about is instead of, as the project's currently designed, we have uh, a 36 inch force main reducing or splitting into two 24 inch force mains that are ductile iron under the river, and we're looking at a bid alternate to make one HDPE bid or bore under the river, and which would be a significant cost savings if we chose to go that route. So that's something that you could see in the future also. Did you modify the... Um system development fees anticipated or you just use historical? We just use the budgeted numbers. For, you mean for the revenue? For the revenue fees? of the new growth we're expecting? And the, we, yeah. yeah, we just use the, the numbers that are budgeted, which I think account, I think include a little bit of growth. I don't think a lot, though. It's pro probably conservative uh -huh. growth. Yes. I have a question. I know I'm new to this, but for the 29 through 31, we're at zero percent. What if we, you know, charge then and just decrease it for the rest of the term? So, like the 2.25. What if we could we not shrink that a little bit in scenario three and then just continue it? So it wouldn't be such a hike. The whole, you know what I mean? And then instead of dropping off at the end, just keep it consistent the whole way through. Right. Yes, we can run a lot of different. I mean, we can yeah, run all like kinds of. We did not run it with just different percentages. Um, we ran it with the 2.25 because that's what we have been using. Mm -hmm. um, but we could run it with lower percentages to see what it would do. That might make the rate payers, you know, happy to pay a little bit less instead of it, you know, dropping off and, you know, at the end of the 10 years to just keep it consistent the whole way through. What I think we'll find is that the yellow will show up turn more. To, and turn to if red. We, if we do it, uh, you know, it's it took until... 28 or 29 before it finally came back up. So it's going to increase the yellow, but that, that may be okay. We, we might be okay, as long as it doesn't show up red. Right. So, yeah, I'd, I'm, I'm with him. I'd like to see another uh, uh, another rate showing a, a, a smaller, instead of a 2.25, maybe a 2% or something, to, just to see uh, maybe a couple scenarios there, but, but I know it will increase the yellow. No, no question. It's got to. Um, 
we'll run another scenario at two percent. Just yeah, just somewhere, just see what, and, and see what what level it would take to to bring a red in. You know, is it is it one, uh, you know, one point eight five or one point nine or something? It, it, and that would be obviously the we would we want to be at least above that. And I think it, would you mind explaining the importance of maintaining that number? The debt ratio. The debt ratio. Well, it's a covenant we made with the bond mm -hmm. uh, buyers that we would maintain our revenue to cover our operating expenses and our debt service by either just one percent or one point two percent, dependent on the scenario. And if we do not meet that coverage, it can be an event of default, which mm -hmm. is not good. They could call the bonds. They um, cause your cause your bond rating to go down. Plus, isn't there that's, some LGC implications um, with that too? Let me address that uh, in a little different fashion. Good explanation <clears throat> by by Gail. When you sell bonds, one of the things that they're concerned about is what getting paid back. So when they want coverage, what they're asking about is not only knowing that you can pay it, but you have a cushion in case you lose some of your customers. Now, in most communities, you have a lot of industry. So really losing a, a customer that may pay you $100,000 a year in, in water or sewer rates is important. In Jacksonville, we do not have any large customers. We have a whole bunch of us. You'll find that in most bonds, the bond covenant is somewhere around 1.3 to 1.4. What does that mean? For every dollar of debt, you're going to get a dollar thirty or a dollar forty to guarantee that you have the coverage. Why do they want it that large? So if an industry suddenly goes out of business or something like that, your revenue comes down, but you still have enough cushion to cover the debt payment. Our debt payment is actually much lower than any debt I think you're going to find for most communities. And that's because we don't have any large customers. The base is not a customer of ours. So, you know, we're very fortunate that way. But that also help, helps explain what is that ratio all about? It's guaranteeing that if you lose customers, you can still pay your bill. Gail, any clarification? No, but I was just going to say, that's how we arrived at the 2.25. I think we've run this model every year for five, six years now. Mm -hmm. And and we were seeing some, if we don't do anything in year five, we're going to have to have a 13% increase. And I think through the Water Sewer Advisory Committee, they recommended to council and the council agreed we would rather do 2.25 every year than to get to year five and have to have a 13 or 18% increase i mean we can we certainly will look at the lower yeah. but that that's how we arrived at 2.25 was that leveled it out i think we agree uh, that that modest increases are are better i, I don't like the the just-in-time scenario because of the the spikes and, and i don't like it either from a from a, a money standpoint either it just it just it's not to me not as as good i'd rather do modest increases uh, to at least keep up with inflation and so forth and so on. But I would like to just see if, if we could perhaps squeeze a little bit out of that, out of that 2.25, even if it's 2.20, any, anything is better than, as long as we don't jeopardize what we're doing with, with our, with our bond and bond partners and future bonds. We got one coming up. We don't want to, we don't want to do anything to jeopardize those. We can absolutely do that and bring it back next week. And then next week, what we'll do is we'll compare the uh, rate of 2.25, which is your current approach, to a, an approach somewhere in the range of 2. Wherever we can drop it, that turns it red at a certain point. We'll just show you those two comparisons. And one other thing, maybe if you could help me understand better next time how our fund balance seems to decline over the years what are the factors that are causing that that are coming into play that that this projection brings our fund balance down when we have maintained it and grown well, it the over projection the past. shows spending it for cip projects spending it down over the years rather than financing all the um the 
Oh, I see. Oh, lining okay. the pipes and and the the regular projects that oh, they so do. So it's a substitute, substitution for debt. That's yes. Exactly we, I mean, your you philosophy go. as a council has been, let's stay out of debt as much as possible, whether it's general fund or water and sewer. So really, the, the debt that we carry is only for the big projects. Okay. And, and that's a good point. Uh, you know, we might still decide to keep it at 2.25 in order to make sure that we have adequate capital so that we can finance some of these other projects without having to resort to some sort of debt. So, you know, it's just something to think about. Well, the other thing I would remind you is, you know, especially on the sewer side, uh, there's a lot of old pipe out there. And we, while we budget every year the projects that we know, we also budget a healthy amount for that that we don't know. And it's usually that that you don't know that continues to tap your, uh, your reserve. Go down any residential street in, in Jacksonville and you'll see all the, all the cuts that we've had through the years. Uh, we can't seem to, we just, it, it hasn't been that long ago we repaved uh, Doris Avenue and, and those of us who travel that every day will tell you there's at least nine or ten cuts in that, in that short stretch that we repaved so already. So. Mayor Zard, if we take a short break. It'll be fine. Come Give that about five minutes. About five minutes work for y'all. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, the next area we'd like to discuss with you is the solid waste fund. As you know, the solid waste fund is broken into two portions. It's basically what we call residential collection and commercial collection. The residential and commercial both charge fees, and you can see that in the proposed budget, it's about a $5.2 million fee. Uh, other revenues, borrowing, transferring uh, portions of the fund balance are all shown there. When you look at the budgets themselves, we have the residential and small business in one budget, and we have the commercial in the other. One of the reasons we do that is because when we got into the commercial business several years ago, you asked us to track that so it would be very easy to make sure that the commercial account is in fact carrying its own weight. I will tell you, the commercial budget is one that totally funds itself. It does not get a subsidy from the general fund. On the other hand, the residential budget does get a subsidy from the property tax. If you notice on page 168, that subsidy for the proposed year is $1.9 million. So what that means is that from residential fees, you're collecting 2.3 million, but almost for every dollar that you're getting from the monthly fee, you're also adding a dollar from the general fund or from your other tax sources. One of the issues that we're going to be having to decide at next week is the issue of recycling, and we're gonna spend some time coming back to that. But in this budget, it is assumed that you're not going to charge for recycling during FY22, and therefore you will notice that the subsidy from the general fund has substantially gone up. If you want that subsidy to come down, then it has to be related to fees. The commercial collection, which is page 171, 2, and 3, Again. commercial fully pays its own way. It is based upon the size of your dumpster and the frequency of your collection. Since we've started this, the sanitation division has 920 businesses that we collect on a weekly basis. And we collect 1,267 dumpsters. And so far in a typical year, we now collect or make over 132,000 tips. That's a pretty good size business. Um, in this year's budget, the FY21 budget, we have purchased two pieces of equipment 
and we've done them under the new procurement program that you authorized where we buy them on a contract to sell them back after three years at a guaranteed 50 percent assuming they haven't been wrecked or in a fire we believe that's going to hold down your fleet repair cost of course only time will tell on that but if you notice on page 173 there are five employees that cover this and with the equipment that we've had uh, it's important for us to get as much new equipment as possible because the old equipment that we started with had a lot of downtime you'll also notice that the department issues on page 173 uh, unfortunately, I'm not recommending any of those, but we'll discuss those at a later time, either this evening or next week. The overhead allocation, again, is where you, part of your budget, part of the attorneys, the finance department, and so forth, it is a cost recovery so that when, for example, John and I spend time on the new Sunoco contract, it's not the taxpayer who's paying for that time. Rather, it is the residential and commercial collectors or, or customers are the ones who are paying for that time. Currently, your residential fees, if you go back in time, you will recall that in... 2014 and 15 and that may ring a bell with some other things such as sales tax changes up to that point there was no fee other than the landfill fee and in two years we over a two budget uh, cycle we began to charge a residential fee and you will notice that today the residential fee is ten dollars a month and six dollars a month the six dollars a month goes to the county landfill if you'll recall last year they went from uh, 47 or so dollars up to 55 or so dollars those may not be the exact right numbers uh, and because of that we had to raise the rates you can see the rates that we charge to small business now who's a small business that's anyone who can be serviced out of the normal 96 gallon container just like you have at your house and we have a number of small businesses that fall into that category and then of course the commercial fee is seven dollars and seventy cents per tip plus the disposal fee and those are obviously are for your two yard four yard six yard eight yard dumpsters and some of those bills can become quite large if you have an eight, an eight yard dumpster and you want it dumped five days a week because you're in the restaurant business, you're going to pay a very hefty fee. No question about that. When you look at the rate increase scenarios, uh, just for information, for every dollar that you increase the residential rate, you're able to get $140,000 and you can read the rest. If you were to go to an additional $5 fee, you could get $700,000. Now, you constantly struggle with how do you pave roads. Well, one way is to redesign how you're getting your money and how you're spending your money. What does that mean? Currently, you are subsidizing the residential collection by $1.9 million. If you did increase it another $5 a month, that would free up $700,000 that you could redirect into paving. But it's like anything else in a budget. There's only so much revenue, and there are always more expenditures than people have the money to pay for and I'm not suggesting that you do that at least not tonight but I'm pointing out to you there are few things you can do without revenue and we know that since paving is one of your priorities this is something that you may want to consider
stormwater fee. <clears throat> many of you refer to it, or many of us refer to it as the rain tax. Your, your water quality and stormwater all are shown here. This is totally self-funded. We, we currently charge $5 per ERU. ERU stands for Equivalent Residential Unit. What is that? That's a square footage number. When this was set up a decade or so ago, there was a study that came in that said for the city of Jacksonville, a typical ERU is 2,850 square feet. What does that mean? That means that if you go to my house or your house, typically we have 2,850 square feet of impervious area. So if it's impervious, the water does what? It runs off. Pervious meaning it soak in. I can tell you in other communities, I've seen this number as low as 2,250. I've seen in other communities as well over 3,000. It just depends on the size of the home. So if you have a neighborhood that has huge homes in it, your ERU may be more. In Jacksonville, it doesn't matter in a, in a residential neighborhood, it doesn't matter how big your house is or how small your house is. The city council has a policy. Everybody pays one ERU. On the other hand, for commercial, you have a large area like, guess what? The city of Jacksonville. We pay ERUs to ourselves. Why? Because we have impervious surfaces. So, you know, we pay, uh, you know, a substantial amount for every building, every parking lot, every road, all of those things that are impervious, we also pay into the fund. And it wouldn't surprise you to know the city of Jacksonville is the largest contributor of those ERUs into the stormwater fund. Well, you want to add anything? Good time to bring up that this is a state mandate. I'm sorry, sir. Say that again. Is this a good time to bring up that this is a state mandate? I think it's an excellent time. The point that Mr. Bittner makes is by state law, we are required to have a stormwater program to reduce pollution. We have a permit that requires certain things such as street sweeping, such as cleaning drainage basins, all those type things. And this is your funding source for it. You have not increased the ERU in a number of years. I'm sorry, the fee, nor do we recommend that this evening. Wally? I think you said it very well. Any questions on that budget? This budget has its own reserve. Right now, it's about $1.8 million. That is not because of debt Rather, it's because we try to save so that when we have a major project, we don't have to go into debt. Uh, Rod, Wally, what was the project in Northwood several years ago? We did the Parkwood Stormwater Project that was funded by the Stormwater Fund. And that's the largest one that we've done. Do you remember how much that cost? Around $4 million, I believe. Okay. But I don't think that one was all cash funded. Okay. I don't recall. But this is, you know, this is where we try to build up the reserve so that when we have a major project, we don't have to raise rates or we don't have to go into debt. One of the interesting things is if you look at the number of ERUs, in 2015, there were 38,020 ERUs. And in 2020, it had grown by almost 2,000. It was at 40,620. If you think about that five-year period, most of that was in the commercial area. So every time you have a commercial parking lot, whatever, you know, they may pay, while a single-family home may pay one ERU, they may pay three, four, five, 20, 50, 100 ERUs, just depending on how much surface that they put out there. So. The, drainage, the drainage budget, if you will drop back to page 148. Okay. 
that's where you actually have the budget. And I wanted to drop back because we're looking forward to June the 1st for many reasons. Dr. Washington, why are you looking forward to June 1st? Pardon me? You're out of school? <laughs> yeah, good answer. Not the one I was looking for. Anybody know what the governor says is going to happen June the 1st? Oh, yeah, we're going to ask that, that you can yeah. assemble. Relax the COVID-19 yes. requirements. <laughs> well, how does that have to do with your stormwater drainage budget? We, for more than a year, have not gotten one prison laborer. Now, why is that important? <laughs> at $1 a day, we normally at the Carteret Correction Institute facility, whatever the right name is, we usually get eight prisoners a day who want to come out of jail and work. And that's commendable. Rather than sitting in or, you know, whatever they do in jail, they want to be outside. And we send a van over every morning and pick up eight people. They get a bag lunch, we bring them back over here, and we work them for four, five, six hours, depending on, you know, different things. And we pay $1 a day. For $8 a day, we get, let's say, six times eight is, Gail, you know, that's what, like 50? Like 48. 48 hours worth of work for $8 a day. We are looking forward to that June 1st date for many reasons. One of them is a lot of your neighborhoods, we've had complaints about ditches not being cleaned. Well, hopefully come June the 1st, the prisons are going to start releasing people for us to use in this inmate labor. We save over a quarter of a million dollars a year by using the inmate labor. It's a pretty phenomenal program. Water quality at page 175, we've covered those things that uh, we wanted to mention uh, regarding the ERUs. Do you have any questions on either of those budgets? Now, I asked Gail this morning, transfers, why is there a zero in FY22? Um, part of that is because there's not any new capital projects, but the um, other part is the stormwater fund was started 12 or 13 years ago with $750,000 from the general fund, and um, the stormwater fund has paid that back, and they made the last payment on that amount last year, so... The general fund has been repaid for the seed money for the stormwater fund. Just want to make sure that the taxpayer remembers or, or understands that when the city council makes a pledge that you're going to loan money and you're going to get it paid back over a period of time, it's staff's responsibility to follow through on that. So you can be proud of the fact that that pledge you made many years ago has now been fulfilled. And can I add to the capital project comment? Uh, while we don't have any capital projects proposed next year in the stormwater fund, what I will say is we have several con going on concurrently, and those are actually being funded. We were able to secure grant funds to actually cover several of those. And I think one of those was to the tune of about $700,000. So we've, we've been able to secure some significant grant funds to help with some of our stormwater projects. And that was following Hurricane Florence. If you have been down by Riverwalk Park, uh, you will see that they're doing some interesting landscaping. What that means is Hurricane Florence showed uh, a system that was rusted and uh, outdated. We received federal FEMA money, and we're in the process now of digging up the entire park, leaving the outside edges where the, the walkways are, but they're probably about 35% finished with burying the pipe. Now, 
what will happen with that project because it will it will go from almost the water's edge to almost the back door of the depot. We're about 35 percent finished with it. The contractor is responsible for digging out the old pipe, installing the new, and then seed and uh, seed. I'm sorry, straw and seed, not sod. Michael LaCorey's folks will come back over the winter and install a sprinkler system. And then in March or so of next year, they will then resod the park and reinstall or install new uh, landscaping in a lot of that area. So if you get a citizen who says, what in the world is going on downtown, uh, that's what's going on downtown. That project is, knock on wood, well ahead of schedule. And hopefully uh, it will be finished in about uh, another eight to ten weeks. And if that's the case, then National Night Out will continue to be relocated to the Commons, but Oktoberfest will most likely be able to stay at Riverwalk Park. But that's what that major project is down there. Any questions on stormwater or water quality? Here are your major decisions that are pending. You've been very kind to go through the department budgets. And even though we've been through the department budgets, I want you to feel free as you study these books at home to call us, call Gail, call me, call John. You notice what a great job John did last week on the IT budget. Um, and I'll make sure he does part of this tonight. But uh, you've been through the departments the real work on your budget begins tonight on these five things. Funding the department issues. And what is a department issue? A department issue is where a department wants something additional, such as personnel, or they want a new record management system, or they want some new activity that is substantial. Now, if what they wanted was a new scoreboard out at the Commons that cost $14,500, that wasn't a department issue. That was simply built into the base budget. Department issues are things that really are long-term cost and normally large cost. Second thing is, how are you going to fund recycling? You'll remember that several months ago, uh, Michael Connors did a, what I thought was an excellent presentation that talk to you about recycling and the fact that the contract with Sunoco is ending. Water and sewer rates. I thought you had an excellent presentation, a lot of good discussion, and we'll continue that discussion next week. Paving of your roads. And then, of course, cost of living increases for your city employees. Those are the five large items that we're going to have to wrestle with. Now, this evening... It is 7 o'clock. What we can do on this evening is begin tackle some of those, or what we can do is on May the 4th tackle hopefully all of those. And then what we'd like to do is see if you're comfortable at the end of May the 4th, which is only a week away, that what we then do is take a two-week hiatus so that Gail can put into the budget every final decision you've made and then possibly adopt your budget on May the 18th. Now, you're not required to. If you want to have more and more and more workshops, we're certainly, you know, that's your decision. We have to have it adopted, of course, by June the 30th. So I would ask you, what's your, your pleasure? You've put in two good hours tonight. Would you like to continue tonight or just start up next week? with the department issues, and really be prepared to go through all five of those items. You know, I'd, I'd like to uh, uh, tackle them again next next week, call it tonight, Mike. And, and partly because, in my mind, some of these are tied together. And yeah. <clears throat> Is that uh, rebel with everyone? Yes. If you could um, help us understand or realize what the recycling cost where when do we know the actual cost that we're going to impose for recycling all right uh, 
I'm going to see if I can make this move. Okay. I'm going to skip all of the DIs real quickly and just get to the heart of this one. The recycling contract. For the last 10 years, we've had to pay nothing. We have been blessed. November 1st, new contract comes in. And what we know is that they're, they're proposing to, to charge us $95 a ton, and we produce 2,500 tons a year. Simple math is a quarter of a million dollars. So next week, what we will do is go through the details, some of the material you saw a couple of months ago. In your base budget, in your base budget, we have assumed that you're going to take that out of the general fund balance because until you tell us that you're going to increase a fee. But to answer your question, the discussion here on recycling is how do you cover the cost of a quarter of a million dollars that you're going to look at next year? And you're going to, you, right now, you, you put it in at the full 95, even though we have the offsets on the, uh, yes. the, the use and the sale and so forth and so on. That's correct. So. And one of the reasons why we do that is the same philosophy that we have on gas. Let's assume the worst and hope for the best. Now, one of the policy decisions that you'll be making on recycling is, do you actually want to assume the worst, or do you want to assume 50% of the worst, if you understand what I'm saying? But that's a dis discussion we'll have next week. What offsets do we have in terms of recycling costs? The only offset that you have uh, currently recycling is picked up at no cost to anyone. Exactly. I understand that. And the offset is when you pick up recyclables and then they sell it for some value. <clears throat> and so what you will notice in one more chart, which I'll get to very quickly if I can, there is a value average price for recycling. So, for example, okay. you can see that some months ago, cardboard was selling at these prices. And at that particular time, your offset would have been $95 minus $22.62, meaning that for those tons, you're going to be paying $73 or so. So we can get into that discussion uh, next week, is how do you cover that cost? And that fluctuates by, by quarter, by month? It, it, my understanding, it, it fluctuates almost daily, but they produce this on a monthly basis. Sim similar to a commodity type of, type of exchange of, of exactly some Exactly what sort. it is. You had something to add, Mr. Carter. As soon as you finish the budget, I want to clarify something on the election. But if it's acceptable, we will close this tonight, pick up on those five issues yeah. with the uh, hope that we can get through all five of them with some direction next Tuesday night. Mr. Carter. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Washington asked a question during my presentation on the election that I took off the top of my head, which was incorrect. She asked, when did the ward system begin? And I told her in the late 90s, and that was incorrect. It actually began in 1991. I showed to Dr. Washington a 1989, excuse me, a 1989, that's correct, a charter amendment. But that charter amendment, Dr. Washington, was not pre-cleared by the Justice Department. They would not accept that. What I, and she asked me to send her a couple things, and I want to send it, of course, to the entire council. One is where there was a lawsuit, and that lawsuit was actually voluntarily dismissed by the plaintiffs because the council took action to establish a ward system that was finally pre-cleared by the Department of Justice. The, own, the other document I'll send beside their, besides their dismissal, which goes through a history, and it's, it's interesting to read, is another document where the only thing for the judge to decide was what the attorney's fees were. And some of you will be interested to read what, what, what that, that says also. So I'll send these two documents out to council tomorrow. Thank you, sir. Uh, one thing this coming weekend is uh, Jacksonville Jamboree. It is a Saturday event only at the Commons from, uh, I believe, uh, roughly noon or, no, I'm sorry, from 3 o'clock until about 6. But then there will be a laser light show at the uh, community college parking lot. We have two sessions, 
Uh, each session has the ability to have about 180 cars. You need to call recreation and sign up. The first session, which is the early session that begins, I believe, 7 or something like that, already has about 150 cars filled at 180. The later session, which is going to be darker and may be a better show, uh, only has about 30 spaces filled. So we hope you and your friends will come out to the community college uh, backside of it for their parking lot where we'll have the laser light show. Um, one thing, uh, <clears throat> the amphitheater, amphitheater uh, over there off Western Boulevard, have, have we started up with the different uh, activities there? I don't know they've actually begun. I believe that most of them begin in May. We may have begun. Ron, do you know whether we've begun any of them? You're right. They'll start the activities in May. Both well, there's actually something at the depot last night, my understanding. But well, at the depot on Monday nights, they have a volunteer band mm -hmm. that comes and practices there. Okay, so and I will say they're actually very good. They're a dance band of just local citizens who come and play jazz. Mm -hmm. So if you want to enjoy good jazz music every Monday night, come on down to the Riverwalk Depot. Sometimes that. I usually get home about 6.15 on Mondays, and they're probably starting about 6.30, I would guess. Is that so. when y'all start dancing? <laughs> <laughs> so I should do it, Jerry. <laughs> so All in favor? Aye. Aye.